Are you good there, Rob? Yeah, we're good. Okay, yeah, I have, I have, take it away. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us on this Parlor Car Chat. Uh, I'm Rob Himoto, uh, president of San Rio Valley Railroad. With me is Nathan Paul, director of the railroad. Um, today is the 109th birthday of the railroad. Um, current ownership is uh, coming up in 14 years, so we're just a small, small slice of that 109-year history of the railroad. Um, we want to kind of talk about basically the last, say, six months to a year because there's been a, a lot of changes uh, on our railroad and, of course, a lot of changes worldwide, globally. And we like to say we're making history every day. So, so today's talk, uh, we're going to talk about what has transpired in the last six months and uh, highlight some of the big changes that have resulted in kind of the next chapter of history being written. Uh, the slide change there, that was an outbound train, and you can see it's a, it's, our trains are getting bigger overall. I mean, I think that that it reflects, it used to be when I first started here at the railroad, uh, a big train, you know, would be a train in the double digits. And now anything, anything under 50 is not big. So uh, just kind of a little eye candy there looking across the farm field of the 1322 working. And I guess it's a good way to talk about the change in management that uh, started about a year ago. So the last several years, our business is kind of stagnant. Uh, we thought we'd change the direction of the company about a year ago. And we kind of went back to the nuts and bolts of, uh, of fine-tuning our customer service. Um, we run a more scheduled railroad, um, provide more consistency and reliability for the customers. Uh, we brought in a, a, a trainer to uh, train all of our personnel to become more efficient, switching is more consistent and more efficient. Uh, rail cars along our line are a lot more organized, so we can switch faster and get our uh, customers' service faster. And as a result, uh, the second half of the 2019 was was super busy. It became our busiest year since we started 14 years ago. And from what I can see historically, it's it, 2019 ended up being the busiest year uh, since the latter days of the sugar beet plant. So, a couple of things that, that Rob talked about there. We run a more scheduled railroad. Like, what does that mean? In this day and age, you hear a lot of buzzwords, precision scheduled railroading, stuff like that. In actuality, running a railroad, especially a short line uh, like we do, the scheduled aspect correlates directly to efficiency for both us and our customers. An example being you can have a general pickup time where you pick up a loaded car uh, almost daily that goes to quad, or, and then you spot the empty, and then it gets loaded overnight. They can schedule their business operations around when we spot them, and by spotting those cars consistently every afternoon, they know that the night shift can load them, and then we pull them the next day. And it also allows those cars to make it timely to Guadalupe, where we interchange with Union Pacific. And when we we take them during a certain window, when the Guad crew isn't switching in the yard, which makes it more efficient for both our railroad and Union Pacific, because we're not trying to work on top of each other. So as and that's just a kind of a broad strokes way of talking about how something as simple as sticking to a schedule is more than just a buzzword. It correlates into things like uh, employee hours of work and and being able to do more within a work day. Yeah, we're really driving that efficiency. Uh, same work crew and we're getting a whole lot more done. Uh, so we're, and we're actually driving our costs down. And driving our cost on it, and we'll we'll get to this later. Is uh, it's 
saving on expenses, we've been able to put more money back into the track to improve infrastructure. Yeah, and I think final and another thought would be, you know, busiest year since the later days of the sugar beet plant in terms of tonnage. How are we doing tonnage wise compared to, to that? You know, moving uh, current 286 cars. So tonnage wise, we're way above what they did towards the end of the Sherby plan uh, days. The cars are roughly double the size, um, in some cases triple the size of uh, 25, 30 years ago. So uh, we're just pulling a lot more tonnage on our track. So the other thing is uh, in our change of philosophy is back 14 years ago, we ran some dinner trains and we ran excursions for freight customers. And uh, we planned to big, bring that back big time. Uh, and Nathan will elaborate more, but bringing freight customers on the line and showing them the line they really get a good sense of, of what happens on our railroad, and uh, they usually go back to their office and try to get more orders. Um, and as far as dinner train operations, uh, we really need to work on the public perception of the railroad. The last few years, it's just freight, and, uh, and uh, really people don't really understand. We really need to get um, public officials out of, back on the railroad and see what we do. Yeah, it, it's it's as much marketing as it is PR, as it is government relations, it's all of the above. And um, to that end, we uh, acquired the SMG 1449. Uh, and for from the history standpoint, the 1449 was it's a 1950-built Bud 10-6 sleeping car, uh, originally delivered to the Union Pacific for what they called their City of Everywhere fleet, and it worked on the City of Los Angeles, the City of San Francisco. Uh, the the car's name was original reporting marks for UP 1449. The name was Pacific Waves. So another another way to put it is it's one of the Union Pacific's Pacific Series sleepers. I went to Amtrak and was part of the head-end power refurbishing program in 1989, and it, it rounded out its Amtrak career in 2001 working out of Florida on the auto train before it was sold uh, from Amtrak to a couple different owners, and then I uh, was acquired from an owner in Northern California. It, it's roadworthy. It was roadworthy when we bought it. I moved via freight service down the Central Valley over to Hatchapi and then Cajon to West Colton and then up to Jemco Yard and finally to us. So uh, with that being said, it's good to know a car's history because I think it's neat and it, it is kind of interesting to find you know, pieces of armor yellow paint here and there and, and little stencils, but our vision for this car is, is for the future and the uh, roomettes were gone when it was purchased. So that end of the car is empty. Uh, well, not anymore. Now it has a ceiling and can lights and sub walls. And basically we're to the point of, of uh, finalizing redoing the floor and installing uh, things like a, a drink station and service bar and other interior appointments. Um, and then it'll be used on the line uh, for freight customers as well as, like Rob said, limited uh, excursion or dinner train operations primarily and through the friends um, of the SMV and uh, already looking for potentially a stable mate <laughs> but one thing at a time uh, we'll finish getting the 1449 going and uh, they'll be working here real soon I'm trying to stay in chronological order. Back in September, uh, we rebuilt the Better Baby Junction Crossing. Um, it's been dis disintegrating for many years. About five years ago, we did a band-aid job. Uh, in September, we went in 
uh, put 136 pound continuous welded rail, and uh, it's almost completed. It needs it needs some fine tuning, but at least the track is in. The track is solid. The track before is disintegrating. So the the photo at left is when we took out the old track. And that was the good half of the old section of track. There was the the other half, like the other lane, if you will, came apart summarily when we pulled it out. This section here stayed together a little bit uh, better, but pretty much disintegrated by the time we got it to the shoulder of the road behind the big Volvo excavator. And it was back to back with 12s for four days. Four days. Yeah. To get it done, um, but we banged it out. So in October, uh, Union Pacific Railroad ran a business train special for the California Short Line Association. And usually it used to run, it normally runs from Sacramento to Reno. And this year they said, we're running it to San Luis Obispo, from Burbank to San Luis Obispo. Uh, which was uh, kind of a big deal to us because it's for the first time other short line operators can see into our backyard. Um, there was quite a bit of UP managers from Omaha and pretty much all the short, 25 short line operators uh, in California, getting a close up view of the, of the coastline and our Guadalupe interchange point for the Santa Maria Valley. And this picture here is uh, the train going past our, our interchange tracks there. So one of the rare times that this CSLRA, the California Short Line uh, Railroad Association uh, fall train trip actually passed by a CSLRA member railroad. Many times they're kind of in the neighborhood, but other than the PHL, this is the only time I can think of that I recall where a railroad was front and center. And what was interesting was uh, riding the train with UP brass, some from Omaha, some from Southern California, they're paying close attention to the track and to the general state of repair as we you know, go down the right of way. Uh, there were several managers from the uh, track department on board making notes. But it was really the SMV's show as far as speaking to the current state of affairs with coast operations because of the volume of traffic that we represent for them. Uh, especially at this, what we'll call the northern end of the southern half of the coast. And it, it really became clear just how much uh, volume we brought to this section of the coastline, especially in the last few years as, as things continue to increase. And so we recall in five years, we have become UP's largest customer on the southern end of the coastline. Actually, they're, they're actually saying the entire end of the coastline now that the oil cans are gone. That's a good feeling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and here's another shot of the business train. It parked overnight in San Luis before returning to Burbank. And there's the uh, museum in the back there. And then on January 22nd of this year, uh, my mom, uh, Betty Himoto, passed away. At the time, at 95 years old, she was the oldest active railroad director in the nation. When we were trying to purchase this railroad 15 years ago, she pretty much forego her retirement to help purchase and rebuild the railroad. And she's active all the way to the end. And uh, it, it's been a big void to fill. Uh, I, you know, I know she was getting up there and she probably should have retired from directorship, but she, she troopered on all the way to the end. So it's just one of those uh, changing of the guard here. Um, uh, we brought in Nancy Nungesser, my sister, to take her place. So uh, this railroad has the longest 
female directors, continuous female directorship of any railroad in the nation, uh, starting, I think it was like 19, it was like around 1951 when Marion Hancock became a director of the railroad. So we've had a continuous uh, female director since 1952. And if we keep going, I don't think anybody's going to touch us because there's, there's not a relative that's even close to that record. So in, in March, of all of you know, COVID-19 hit. And uh, Nathan and I and, and Ray, you know, the directors, we were already, we were trying to be on top of it the first week of, in March trying to develop uh, emergency plans. And uh, it's funny, we, we developed an emergency plan and we really had it enacted within a week. Uh, because by mid-March, everything was shut down. But railroads are deemed essential businesses. And so we had to keep going. And we never stopped operating. Uh, we had to make some tape changes. The rail yard and facilities are locked down, have been locked down, closed to all visitors. Um, we implemented procedures to clean and sanitize the workplace, trying to keep our, our employees healthy. We pretty much instruct our employees, hey, you, you have to really quarantine down, stay away from everybody because we need you guys here healthy and moving freight. Uh, and we really weren't sure what was going to happen with the freight traffic. You know, at least there's a lot of business out there that had to close or or curtailed or they just lost a lot of business just because other businesses were closing, people were shut in. And what we found was um, our business, our traffic skyrocketed. Um, frozen vegetables, uh, pack away lots of refrigerator cars. Usually in the winter time, um, refrigerated cars slow down. We never missed a beat. We, in fact, uh, before COVID hit, um, we were doing record amounts of, of refrigerated cars, and it never stopped. Um, I was told, hey, we need to restock supermarket shelves. A lot of them going Midwest and back east, and that continues today. To today, and as a result, farmers. Um, they're asking the farmers, hey, we need more more vegetables to freeze and get to supermarkets. So it's been a boom time for the farmers, and we've had record amount of, of inbound fertilizer and tractors as local farmers rush to replant crops. Um, Picks wheat and lineage, our packing houses, they're more retail. They, they're, they can go and switch to supermarkets. You hear about food being dumped and things like that, and that's that's the, the supply chains that supply restaurants and big institutional places like colleges and things like that. And uh, our, our companies around here uh, adapt really well, going packing it straight to the retail market, and so. Uh, both our customers and us have been uh, have been busy this whole entire time. The other thing is building materials never slow down. Um, housing on the Central Coast is considered an essential business, so housing uh, starts never slow down. Construction never slowed down. In fact, all of our business, all our customers at work are considered essential businesses, and they. have all of them increased business during this pandemic. So if we continue at this rate, this will be this will be our large biggest year ever for tonnage in car loads. It's just kind of been amazing. This represented some challenges too because the keeping the train working, you know, keeping the guys working and, and keeping the trains running when Everything outside of what we do is a little more complicated. You know, it's hard to pack your lunch to come to work if there's no bread on the shelves at the grocery store, stuff like that. And, you know, when you say we implemented a plan, which we did to sanitize the workplace, 
the railroad does not lend itself to sanitization. <laughs> it's it's a dirty environment. But um, you know, through diligence and basically the same work ethic that our crews put into their day to day work, you know, they've embraced the idea of the this is plan and, and how to stay healthy and we're making it happen. And then the other thing is we always kind of were semi prepared for emergencies. We saw what happened at Thomas Fire and uh, mudslides. Uh, the railroad was really the first to get their infrastructure back in order and moving passengers and freight. And so we understand uh, this railroad is critical to um, critical to to keep the economy going when there's a, a major disaster. So we had actually a stockpile of supplies of even like cleaning materials. We actually stockpiled cleaning materials. So when we couldn't get it, at least we could keep cleaning. <laughs> Just things like that. We so um, we were a little bit better prepared than we thought we were. I mean, we were kind of panicking trying to get supplies, uh, but we, we kind of made it through it here. So the photo there, that's uh, six inbound, the six cars that were just spotted in the Osborne yard for unloading, and that's drywall. So that customer, six cars at a whack, that's a good increase in business. <laughs> yeah, and our transload yard in Osborne has been busy the whole entire time with uh, drywall and lots of fertilizer. But with all this traffic, and we actually had kind of a wet, wet winter this year, um, business winter in over 30 years in a wet winter, it it played havoc on our tracks. We we really struggled. That that was the one thing is is our track was um, really taking the front of this tonnage with with wet weather, and so we really had to step up our our maintenance away program. Um, fortunately, well, unfortunately for them, our neighbors to the south, the Fillmore and Western Railway, um, the, of course in March, they had to shut down you know, with no tourists and uh, the movie industry in, on hiatus. So they were able to send their track crews up to help us out. And uh, it's been a great help because the last two months, we did a lot of projects. We put in, we're not sure yet, we're still counting, over a thousand ties in just a couple of months. Lots of rail, uh, lots of raw, lots of resurfacing. Um, that's the uh, west leg of the Y that you see. Um, that Y in the airbase branch, north south branch, I've seen a lot of traffic because of, uh, of our lumber and uh, our cable plant have been going full tilt. Our cable plant um, is working 24 hours a day, three shifts a day. So they're taking in a lot of rail cars also. And that's our only runaround on the airbase branch. And we've had to put a retie it, uh, ballast and tamp it. So when you're looking at that, just kind of to explain, when we say we replace ties, so obviously the ties wear out, they rot with time, you know, and, and they they wear from the bottom and the top. The bottom from moisture, the top from the cutting action that occurs from the weight of the train passing over the rail, uh, pushing down, cutting into the surface. So as they need replaced, uh, the procedure is to identify which ties need replaced and remove the spikes and the tie plates, and that creates a little bit of gap between the bottom of the rail and the top of the tie. Then we use the backhoe perpendicular to push down and slide that tie generally towards the backhoe. Now, in the picture here with all the, the ballast, it's easier. Other places, it's where the track is sunk, you have to do a little bit of excavation initially, and that's why we're putting so much rock ballast back into it. Yeah, uh, to remedy that for the future. So once the old tie is out, you dig out any uh, ballast 
and stuff that has sloughed into the area to position the new tie and slide it back in with the backhoe and generally work it back and forth using the, the teeth on the backhoe as a grabber to set the rough elevation of the tie uh, to minimize the work later for jacking uh, when you have to spike it. So uh, the crew working that way with the backhoe and two or three guys uh, can do dozens and dozens of ties a day. You add a second backhoe, and the record was what, 70 last month? Yeah, in a day, seventy-two. Yeah, yeah, seventy-two like that, yeah. ties in a day, which is, which is pretty respectable considering there's not an automated string of track-mounted equipment like Class One would have, just you know people with muscles and backhoes. <laughs> That's a good one, drill. They did uh, four of them did thirty-seven ties that day. With just one backhoe. That's over near Delta. And then I uh, had uh, someone Western bring in their ballast regulator with the rear broom. Over in the fields, we get a lot of dirt on the traps, and they trap moisture, they rot ties, they, they rust out rails. So with this thing, they, they're able to broom out the dirt and leave the, the rock. Um, many of our ties that we're replacing right now, it was installed between the early and mid-1960s when the SMBR last perform, performed a major uh, tie work just before Captain Hancock passed away. Pretty much did ties over the entire line, but they're all kind of sort of coming apart at the same time. I mean, we've been doing ties, quite a bit of ties the last three or four years, but there's just other spots that we haven't done and it's starting to go. And then in May, yeah, in May, uh, of course, we had uh, the civil unrest, which really increased vandalism and, and theft uh, around all the businesses and homelessness. So the second week of May, uh, Nathan arranged to have a coordinated cleanup with the city of Santa Maria. We did a major cleanup of, of most of the right away in town. Yeah, the homeless had in, in there are many factors at play regionally and at the state level that have resulted in really a, a exploding homeless population that uh, are uninhibited when it comes to occupying private property. And so, uh, working with the police department and uh, the city, ident we identified these key areas where it had gotten bad, and then using a, a third-party contractor and basically declaring a, a blitz, we went in and, and cleared the right-of-way, and uh, as a result, it's a lot safer for the train crews, and the even the citizens uh, of the city are safer because of the reduction in amount of, of debris uh, there, with the unrest, there was a fire that was started in the right of way. Uh, somebody lit a, one of the ties on fire actually in the track, but that fire didn't spread because the right of way was clear edge to edge. So uh, it was it was nice to have had that done. And we just finished this past week another major cleanup at Bell Storage, which is one of the busiest places on the railroad because of. Uh, the adjacency to Pick Suite, the packing house, and Bell Storage, the area around that now looks like the surface of the moon, which is really nice. <laughs> it's going to be a lot more efficient to work there and a lot safer as well. Yeah, uh, there's certain parts of the railroad that at the end here, uh, uh, we've made a requirement that you had to work in pairs uh, because there's a lot of dangerous elements. 
So cleaning up the right of way really alleviated that. Also in the Osborne yard here, uh, we've had some minor problems, but uh, we now patrol uh, the Osborne yard 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, I think it's helped because surrounding businesses have been complaining to me that they get hit like all the time, theft, vandalism, graffiti, and um, we've been able to ward that off. So knock on wood, that continues. <laughs> it's just the new normal, I think. We just have to be more proactive yeah. in uh, protecting our, our greatest asset, which is the railroad, it's literally the railroad itself. Right. Um, we never really like to spend resources on cleaning up the railroad, but on the other hand, it, it makes it makes our railroad doesn't look like it's abandoned. It looks like it's a vibrant and, and we're moving traffic when it, when the right of way is clean. It gives our customers more confidence that the railroad is in good shape and operating, and it changes the public perception. You get a lot of people saying, "I didn't know the railroad was still running." It looks like it's it's weedy. Like no trains run through there, so cleaning it up, uh, cleaning all the trash out, it, it really changed the perception of the railroad. Yeah. Okay. Um, so our other big news is our Jeep Nine flagship locomotive, eighteen oh one. Um, it's been down how many years now? Four or five years. Every bit of five. I think it's yeah. five. Yeah, you're <laughs> right. Um, so the locomotive have recently been completely rewired from head to toe. Uh, it's had some major repairs performed. Uh, power assembly was replaced, um, among many other things. So keeping our fingers crossed, we may have the Eakin one back in action this week as early as Monday. We're very close. So that's a really exciting thing. Um, with with our increased traffic, uh, the 1801 is our best puller. It can easily pull 60 to 80 cars at a whack, so we don't have to double and triple over. Um, so. I, I can't wait. The 1801 <laughs> is a is a puller, and like when you're working the train, it's not just what it can pull once you brake inertia and get rolling, that engine can dig in and start a cut of cars moving one direction or the other with tremendous, tremendous torque, getting it, getting it rolling, and that directly correlates to efficiency because when you're on the ground switching and you have to move cars back and forth, the quicker you can dig in and get them moving, the quicker you can complete that movement. So, uh, Rafael Sanchez our, our uh, lead engineer, he and I have been talking. I can't wait to come work on the train when the 1801's up and running. That'll be gonna like stand on the front of it and uh, like the Titanic movie. You know, I'm just <laughs> with my face in the wind, <laughs> being happy. <laughs> and then if we have a huge tonnage train, we could view both the, the 1322 and 1801 together, and we could pull trains that have never been pulled on the SMV. Never really had this much traction power all at once there with the two locomotives. Which we're going to need it. That's <laughs> yeah. the way things are going. So we, we got a, a lot of future plans, um, long-term plans and short-term plans. One of the short-term plans is uh, we're partnering up with Fillmore and Western Railway, and we're going to have a, a full car department here. Um, we're going to start with mobile car repairs, and by next year, uh, we'll build a facility here in Osborne Yard to do full work on, on rail cars. Uh, two things, it'll keep our customers' cars on the road and not in the shop. If we repair stuff here, it, it'll get on the road, and it'll, it'll make it to destination without hitting any car shops. And delay in shipments. And the other thing is it'll increase business because um, uh, the large railroads that have cut their car departments, there's less car departments. And so customers 
they're looking for places to send cars to get repaired. So it, it'd be another thing that will really, really drive uh, more traffic to the SMV. Um, yeah. It's, it's, so in terms of call repair, like what does that mean? And, and that is anytime a, a car is, is operating on the National Rail Network in transit, it's subject to inspection at terminal points. And if it's found to have defects, it can be set out and repaired by the, the railroad where, where it's at. So when a load, for example, leaves here, like Rob said, and if, if there's a defect in the car and it's bad ordered, it, it gets delayed in transit. So our customers are going to be better off when those cars can be repaired here prior to leaving. Uh, and as far as making history, with the car repair shop set up on site and the ability to take in other cars uh, for work or work on the cars that are here, it'll represent a, a revenue stream for the company and a business that is that is new, you know, and forging a new direction. And then, uh, and then long-term plans is uh, we're we're working on a a, a document to develop uh, adjacent properties next to the rail to be rail served. Um, the city of Santa Maria and Santa Barbara County, they they have plans that basically ignore the railroad. Um, they put inappropriate zoning next to the railroad, and if we come, we're going to come up with a master plan. It's uh, with our vision of what uh, what should be next to the railroad. Um, we can a railroad can really attract major industries and businesses. Because we, we need jobs. We need housing, but we need jobs. Um, and then the other thing is, we've always been kind of allergic to this, uh, passenger rail. But uh, really, in our future, we're going to have to participate and help move people. The city of Santa Maria is growing like crazy. The Central Coast is growing. Um, 101 can only handle so much traffic. And so in our master plan, um, years down the line, is our master plan is we'll, we'll have to provide passenger commuter service. And, uh, and it'll be a regional function, um, say, from San Maria to Paso Robles or San Maria to Guadalupe to help alleviate traffic. Because with more housing, it's going to create more people, which is more traffic congestion. So we're, we're doing this long-term plan to kind of explore everything. And um, uh, at some point, we'll have a draft. And, um, and any, any of you would like to participate in, it, in this, um, we'll, we're welcome for suggest, suggestions or anything else, any input. Because eventually, we're going to package this up and and send it to the city and county and say this is a, this is our vision. Um, the city, by the way, in their 1992 uh, uh, plans for for traffic flow include a a light rail system within Santa Maria. So we're going to brush that off and say, hey, you know, you guys have a plan that will will be willing to eventually enact here in the future. Um, I think it's funny the way you said we've been allergic. <laughs> but ultimately starting that dialogue is, uh, is going to be important because it's the way of the future. It is, and it is the way of the future. I mean, you look at other countries um, in Europe, in Japan. Japan has many short line railroads. And uh, many of them, they haul passengers um, to alleviate traffic congestion. And um, we're trying to figure out a, a way to do it profitably. It, it's it's pretty rare to do this profitably without government help. Um, there's a couple 
went uh, that Florida East Coast Railway. Uh, they're in the passengers, and they have somehow made it profitable. Uh, and then other long-term plans is electrifying the line, so it would be carbon neutral. So we're trying to preserve our right of way and and not get it to shrink down like the city wants us to do because uh, we need apparatus to electrify our, our railway, you know, next 20 years, say. But you know, the future is coming, maybe maybe coming faster. We see electric cars coming, so um, electrifying the railway. We we're trying to make long-term plans for that somehow. And uh, well, thank you for joining us. Um, we work closely with the Friends of Santa Maria Valley Railroad. Usually, we have a, a annual barbecue around August, and um, we're going to do something different. We're going to do uh, some sort of virtual tour, virtual live tour. And we're working on that, hopefully September or something like that. And so you've got to be a member to uh, participate. Um, and uh, we put the, uh, the website up here. Um, once again, thank you for joining us. And uh, we're happy to share what's been happening here. Uh, this, there's been a lot of changes in this world, a lot of changes here. Uh, fortunately, it's, it's been a lot of good changes. We're just so fortunate that we're just an essential business that many people depend on us. We're able to grow in these very trying times. <laughs> Rob, are you still there? Yeah, yeah. I'm still here. I was just going to say, uh, I've opened the mics up again, so if anybody wants to ask you guys a question, um, we've got a couple minutes we can do that if you want. Okay. And thank you, Diane, while I'm thinking of it, for reminding me to start the recording. We got it done. Yeah. Um, hey, Rob. Tell us more about um, the passenger car that you're fixing up. How close are you to having that done? Well, well so that's, that's my baby. Um, <laughs> I, I don't mean to be, I don't know exactly because some things, for example, drilling holes in stainless steel. You think, well, there are drill bits for stainless steel, you need to drill a hole. To drill the holes that I needed to run new electrical wire through the inside structural members, it took three weeks of trial and error with different cutting oil and different drill types from manufacturers. So when I say I don't know, it's because like an unforeseen delay like that, I couldn't believe it. I wanted to bash my head against the wall. It's so frustrating. <laughs> but it's 1950 stainless stuff is yeah. extraordinarily uh, strong. My, my goal is to have the interior in it by, like, by completed, like by Christmas time this year, by the end of the year. Um, it's really a matter of, it's kind of like lining up dominoes, and it takes a long time and you don't see a lot of process, uh, progress, and then all of a sudden the dominoes start to fall. So, like, Rob popped in the other day, and I was frustrated because I didn't feel like I'd made a lot of progress. Looking up dealing with the... The, all the conduit in for the can lights and, and whatnot. No, I think you've actually made a lot of progress, which felt good to hear. Uh, so I'm, I'm optimistic for the end of the year uh, to be able to, to get it going. And, and it also kind of depends on what we've got going here, because sometimes I'll reroute effort and do other stuff, you know, like if we have a track project. But uh, taking definitely taking longer than I thought it was going to. And yet, so it goes. You know, such is life. Um, but we're, I'm pushing hard to, to get it done. Well, well, the original kind of goal was 
this is our yeah. and with COVID, I think Nathan got a reprieve there, so it gave yeah. it more time. <laughs> Well, it's a beautiful car. I look forward to seeing it when it's done. Oh, yes. You'll have to join us. Yeah. I will. <laughs> Any other questions out there? Well, Rob, Nathan, thank you very much for uh, doing this Santa Rio Valley Railroad parlor car chat for us. And uh, you can look forward, uh, let people know if they missed it and express an interest. Uh, it should be on the website, a link to the recording, um, probably later today or certainly sometime tomorrow. So um, thank you all, and uh, we will see you next week when we actually continue the Santa Maria Valley Railroad topic to some degree by uh, taking a look at what uh, the steam locomotive number 205 looked like about five years ago when we visited it in Oregon. That will be our topic next Saturday, 10 o'clock Pacific. We'll see you all then. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.